Welcome, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us here today. So welcome to our presentation. So many towns, one space, uh, mapping an emerging ecosystem. Um, maybe just to start with some, oops, just navigating the technology. Hello and introduction. So um, presenting today, we're presenting today from Life Itself. Um, so Life Itself is an organization committed to, to inner work and also deliberate action for a radically wiser and weller world. So we're interested in, in approaches, particularly that integrate inner work with outer action and do a variety of activities from research to um, running community hubs and enterprises uh, in service of a radically wiser and weller world. Um, and maybe, so Elisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Elisa and I will be mostly presenting today and we also have um, our colleague Rufus as well from Life Itself with us. Um, Elisa, do you want to say a few words about who you yeah. are? Just just hello really from me um yeah I don't actually don't, I don't know what to say um but um yeah just happy to be with you all today um and yeah happy to get into like keen to get into discussion around these topics that we're um get quite excited about enough itself um yeah. Thanks, um Rufus would you like to introduce yourself a bit yeah, it's wonderful to see uh, people. And um, yeah, my name is Rufus, uh, Rufus Pollock. I'm a, a co-founder of Life Itself. And I've also been you know, very interested in these topics of the the emerging ecosystem for a long time. And uh, really, yeah, really pleasure to be here. And um, maybe just a bit, a little bit more maybe about Life Itself for people who don't know of it. Uh, it's a, We're a collective of pragmatic utopians. We've existed since... 2015 and we're dedicated to you know contributing or to to seeking and and, and building and making and nurturing a radically wiser weller world um and that you know we run hubs we do research we start businesses um but we're kind of a different things happen within the collective but that's what we are we're a collective dedicate of pragmatic utopians uh, dedicated to a radically wiser weller world so yeah um and yes my name is Catherine I'm also um I've been working at life itself for the past couple of years within life itself's research activities uh and this ecosystem mapping has been been one of the main projects of focus uh for us in the past few years so very excited to be able to share this with people today a little I didn't quite expect so many people to be here so it's very exciting um and also, yeah, feeling slightly nervous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wonder if we'd like to maybe take a moment to kind of check in, just see like who's in the room a little bit more um, and arrive here together in this digital space. Um, and so what we'd like to invite is if you'd like to just write a little message in the chat and share your name, um, where you are, where you're, where you're joining this call from, and three words that describe how you are feeling right now. Um, so just feel free to share that in the chat. Yuli joining from Toronto. Hello. Told any mystery, intrigued. Curious, intrigued, confused. <laughs> Grounded, quiet mystery. Hmm. Lovely. Nice to see the, the variety. And wow, yes, Jonas calling in from Zimbabwe. Mm. 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 
Thanks for sharing, everybody. Um, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I'd like to just give a little outline of the event today. So, okay, so we are uh, going to be starting with a presentation uh, with some, some discussion as well, and that's likely to take about 45 minutes. And so the, the presentation will start with some context, so a brief overview of life itself's previous ecosystem mapping work. Um, and then kind of outlining what's the situation now, where are we at? And then going a bit more into detail into some of our recent and current work. And so we'll have uh, some breakout rooms and a whole group discussion at the end. And our intention with this event, this with this presentation is to kind of offer like an introduction to, to our work um, to research and map this emerging ecosystem. And then also to invite feedback and reflections um, and constructive, ha have some constructive conversation to help us to clarify and develop our mapping work and approach. Um, so, okay, so I think maybe we'll just launch right in. Um, I'm just navigating a bit. Okay. Make sure I can see what I want to see. Okay. Um, okay, so starting with, so the context, okay, we see this um, ecosystem emerging. And I think, you know, this, this uh, word cloud comes from the Limicon homepage. And I think, you know, the very fact that Limicon is happening is kind of testament to the fact that there's this some kind of ecosystem out there emerging and like, you know, this word cloud shows, okay, we're beginning to, to sort of co cohere and coalesce around there's certain recognizable practices, certain recognizable ideas, key thinkers, key hangout places. Um, but, you know, it's like, it's still kind of quite vague and swirling. Um, so we sense that something's out there, but not entirely sure always like what exactly is it or no, um, or what's its identity. Um, so we started at Life Itself mapping this emerging ecosystem in 2019 slash 2020. So we'll just walk through um, uh, briefly some of our previous work. So in 2019 and 2020, when we started mapping, um, this we we produced a, a report, the st state of sense making, and in this report, we in this kind of preliminary uh, mapping phase, we identified three core thematic areas which seemed to tie together the varied groups that we were seeing in the space, um, and they were collectivism. Um, Holism and kind of counterculturalism, and so so we identified some organisations that seem to be part of this space. And on the right here, you can see also kind of some of the key trends and key terms and buzzwords that were beginning to define this space. So things like metamodernism, regenerative culture, embodiment, and community, and also kind of sense making. Um, interests in like governance and systems change, uh, collective intelligence, collective wisdom. So at this stage, it's all quite broad brushstrokes, but beginning to sketch out um, some kind of high level trends and high level commonalities. Um, in 2021 to 2022, um, we did some more detailed work to compile a directory of organizations and visualizations. And so, and here we defined uh, a framing that we termed PIP. So that stands for paradigmatic, integrated or integral and pragmatic. So with this phase of the mapping and with the, the directory of organizations that we were compiling, um, we were looking for organizations that were taking approaches to social change that were paradigmatic and by that we mean seeking to change um, systems and structures and also the underlying worldviews and narratives, the, world, the worldviews and narratives uh, and values that underpinned systems 
that underpin systems and policies and institutions. Um, these organizations that we were looking at were also taking integrated or integral approaches. So that could be integrating multiple worldviews, multiple ways of knowing and ways of sensing, but also most commonly kind of integrating inner, inner, inner and outer work or kind of inner, more than one dimension of inner change, cultural change and systems change. And then also pragmatic. So there's a kind of like, um, you know, they're not just maybe monks meditating, but there's a, a level of kind of engagement and sort of prag pragmatic, uh, pragmatic engagement with the world um, or some kind of uh, plausible theory of change. So just to give a little uh, snapshot of what that looked like, uh, we had this directory of uh, almost 100 organizations and a, two, a couple of visualizations. So one visualization, we mapped um, organizations by their primary topic. Um, and then a second visualization, we had um, organizations mapped based on their approach to social change and I think it's a bit small so I'll just uh, explain so so the top corner of the triangle is inner change so referring to to kind of change of like individual values and beliefs um, and then cultural change is kind of change at the level of um, narratives uh, collective narratives and collective beliefs and collective social norms and then systems change kind of change at the level of institution, structure, policy. Uh, so you can see, for example, something like Extinction Rebellion, you know, clearly engaged with the climate crisis, but it's closest really to the systems change, not so much, well, not so much perhaps engaged in cultural change and, and certainly less with the inner change. Um, whereas something like Buddha, Triratna, Buddha Field, um, very close to the inner change, so change of consciousness. Uh, engage with mindfulness and spirituality, but less perhaps with the less focus or priority on the systems change. Can I can I just say something briefly mm -hmm. to that, Catherine? To add, I mean, for people, one of the challenges you know that you saw that we were starting to encounter is like, okay, just take Tri Ratna, you know, uh, at, or like the Buddha Field event, or take Palm Village. Um, these were groups we saw somehow maybe connect the space, but also then there's like, let's say Commonweal or there's, um, you know, you know, Extinction Rebellion or there's Perspectiva or there's, you know, blah. Were, was there a coherency? You know, one of the challenges is you start to dig a bit deeper often of this kind of surface level sense of connection. You know, what, you know, what is the coherence and also how, how are there useful ways to kind of, um, Oh, we've just Sorry. gone, um, just gone on. And so one of the aims here, and people will see this is kind of borrowed a little bit from the classic kind of quadrant diagram of integral that, you know, basically this is like inner change. In, there's inner personal change at the top. There's kind of inner we collective change, cultural change at the bottom left. And then there's kind of system change. So we, we've left out the top right quadrant. But what you could even see in this diagram was a sort of clustering. I mean, this what also took us quite a lot of time in 2021 is we actually went through and with kind of some experts, you know, kind of tried to classify these hundred organizations in, in these dimensions of like, what was their approach to paradigmatic change? And what you could see here was there was kind of some clustering, you know, also in this diagram, there's like a bottom right, you know, surprisingly people more on systems change. Um, there's, you know, groups on this kind of gradient of inner change. And then there's maybe some in, in, in the middle. I mean, th these are always debatable, the weightings. But what you could see was, you know, are there useful ways to understand maybe subparts of the ecosystem? And also to ask this question, what is there? And what is the coherence? And, and what, what things are kind of closer to the center? And what, what organizations or activities or principles or ideas are kind of further from the center of this emerging ecosystem? Um, thank you so much, Catherine. You know, back, back to you. Thanks, Rufus. Um, okay, so context. So we, we see this emerging ecosystem um, and we have started work to map it over the past few years. And then also, um, you know, we notice there's many, uh, many different terms, you know, that people are using to try and describe this space and also many other efforts to map. Uh, and so, yes, we recently um, compiled a, started compiling a list of 
of related mapping efforts. We just, uh, here's a, just a snapshot of kind of one of them. Um, and, and yeah, so this fact that there's many different names and terms used to describe this ecosystem, which we'll get into um, in more detail later, seems to reflect the emergent nature of the space. And, and at the same time, it also may reflect real differences. So it's not clear really like, are these different names for the same space and they're gonna converge into a single clear identity at some point, but we just haven't reached that point yet. Or is it that, you know, you know, it's gonna remain, um, maybe there will be no single clear identity ever. Um, so that is something. Okay, thanks for sharing the link, I think, Lauren. Um, okay, so yeah. So what are the kinds of challenges that we're meeting uh, at this stage of mapping. So firstly, the ecosystem is complex and sprawling and still emerging. So it's hard to get a handle on what it is exactly. Um, I think for those who are familiar as well as for newcomers. And this um, makes coherent participation in the space more difficult as well as constructive conversation. Like it's hard, harder to talk about something where you kind of don't have like, a, okay, we're talking, a reference for it or it's when you have a name or, or some for something you can point to it more easily and be clearer that you're talking about the same thing um we also have a kind of tension that we've noticed come up a little bit in our own uh, internal discussions and conversations around our mapping approach is so how do we go about making sense of the space and kind of distilling and synthesizing uh into something more concrete and accessible um but make, and making sense of commonalities and differences whilst also not unduly imposing uh, de definitions on the space which are reductive and limiting. Um, so yeah, and then so some kind of questions that come up for us are like, are there or should there be common principles? Is there a, a center to the space? Is there a common name or should there be one? Um, and then finally, we realize that mapping is a very broad term which can refer to many different activities and, and serving many different functions. Um, so when we talk about mapping, what are we mapping exactly for whom and why uh, is a key question that we've been sitting with. Um, so a map might just help me kind of orient to a space, like see the key features um, and landmarks, or it might also kind of be trying to help me trace a route to somewhere or match me up with a certain uh, ma match me up with a certain resource or certain goal and these can be kind of different uh, purposes for different forms of map um, so yeah I think handing over to Elisa now this is kind of our latest iteration of uh, a, a hypothesis in re response to what exactly are we trying to map right now and why Great, thanks, Catherine. So, so yeah, um, our current focus then in response to kind of the challenges and questions that Catherine laid out is to have three levels of mapping. Um, so the first level uh, is effectively kind of outlining our own framing and preferred term for the ecosystem, which is the second Renaissance. And we'll come to that in a bit. Uh, the second level is um, mapping out the other kind of names and terms that people use to refer to this space or ecosystem. So kind of like a Rosetta Stone of what they are and how they fit together. Um, and finally, zooming out even further and looking at um, the broader context still, uh, how this kind of emerging space fits with other ecosystems or movements in the, the broader social change sphere. And... Uh, today in this talk, we're focusing mostly on the second level. Uh, well, for the rest of this presentation, that is. Um, and we have a little um, menti poll um, for you. Um, so I'm going to share the link for that in the chat. Um, so... Um, we are interested to hear from you um, in in the mentee kind of what are 
some of the the terms that you tend to use uh, to describe the space uh, that Limicon, for example, is part of. Um, so just take a moment, uh, if you can, to go over and yeah, add some responses. The link you gave, I'm not able to enter a response into that. Okay. I just see maybe, the slide. Okay. Maybe, okay, that might be just for us as presenters. So you could try instead to just go to menti.com and use the code that we have on there um, on the slide. Thanks for flagging that. Um, Does Sorry, the code work? Code? Oh, that code, that, uh, yep. that number there. Yes. Has that worked for anyone? Yes, we've got one. Yep. This one. Okay, amazing. Okay. Do people need a bit more time? Yep, so we have Sangas. Thank you, Yuli. Okay, this is really interesting, and there's definitely some in there that I I haven't heard of. Um, mm. I can see a lot of uh, different spellings of meta crisis. Okay, that's great. I think we can, yeah, move on. Thanks, everyone. Um, and it, it was, it's, yeah, particularly interesting to see what kind of people come up with before um, we've primed you. Um, and we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to come back to this um, in a bit. But for now, um, yeah, we're. Just going to um, run through some some of these names, many of which kind of appeared uh, on the word cloud, uh, starting with the Second Renaissance, uh, which is uh, at life itself is kind of the the uh, name that we've landed on uh, to kind of refer to. I guess a number of things. Um, first of all, the the current historical period uh, that we inhabit as a time between worlds. 
and this is obviously a reference to the first Renaissance, which, um, you know, the kind of 15th, 16th century uh, movement in Europe that marked the um, beginning of the transition from traditional to modern society. And so the second Renaissance is kind of this period of um, a, another such transition from the modern world to something new uh, that is still emerging. And um, it can also refer to kind of the emerging paradigm or paradigms. And we're using it also as a as a term to refer to the, the ecosystem or movement itself. Um, and the term was first used um, by Franco Varela in his book, Ethical Know-How, um, where he writes, it is my contention that the rediscovery of Asian philosophy, particularly the Buddhist tradition, is a second renaissance in the cultural history of the West. Um, and we kind of like this term because it has kind of hopeful connotations and it um, it also points to a pe the period of, of rebirth um, rather than kind of predefining a destination. But uh, we're not going to say very much else on the Second Renaissance now. We actually have another talk where we go into detail about our framing of the Second Renaissance on Friday. I think it's at 12 p.m. EST. Um, so if you're interested to hear more, please come to that as well. Um, and then, of course, we come on to uh, the liminal web. Um, so, yeah, it's it seemed from the world cloud uh, that this is, amongst this group, probably the most popular term, which makes sense, we're at Limicon. Um, and, yeah, originally this came from a blog post published by Joe Lightfoot in 2021. Um, where he was attempting to map um, what he called an emergent subculture of sense makers, meta theorists, and system poets. Um, and we're we're going to run through these fairly quickly. And I imagine, yeah, many of you are familiar with many of these already. Um, so then we have polycrisis, which actually I think didn't feature very much in the word cloud, I believe. Um, and polycrisis is defined by the World Economic Forum as the various crises in economics, politics, geopolitics, and the environment, which are feeding into each other, exacerbating already difficult circumstances. Um, essentially, it's when multiple systems are in crisis simultaneously. Um, and as a term, polycrisis has become relatively mainstream. Um, I would say even outside of the, the, the kind of this ecosystem. Um, and just to illustrate that, it was chosen by the Financial Times to describe. Uh, like as the word to describe 2022. Um, and then a more niche term is the meta crisis. Um, even though it's very much like popular within this ecosystem, um, meta means kind of after, beyond, or transcending. And yeah, according to Jonathan Rawson from Perspectiva, the meta crisis is the underlying crisis driving a multitude of crises. Um, so it's kind of about having to better understand who and what we are um, as human beings, individually and collectively, in order to um, fundamentally change how we act. So it's um, more fundamental than the poly crisis. Um, while the poly crisis is kind of still about stuff happening out there, the meta crisis points more to interiority and relationality. Um, and yeah, we've got some pictures there with... Daniel Schmattenberger, that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, and an essay from Jonathan uh, Browson. Um, then we have metamodernism, uh, another really popular term in the space. Um, it's kind of used to articulate developments in contemporary culture and society. Um, the, the idea is to represent a move beyond postmodernism. And uh, yeah, so have become quite popular, particu particularly through um, the Hansi Freinacht books, uh, The Listening Society and Nordic Cardiology. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty common term to refer to the emerging cultural paradigm and the ecosystem that's been forming around it. Um, then we have integral. Um, so another uh, very well-known term uh, coming from American philosopher Ken Wilber and his attempt to integrate different approaches and frameworks into a single kind of holistic view. Um, and yeah, since its development in the 70s, there's been quite a big like global community um, 
of meta theorists and practitioners that has evolved around it. And in this space, there's definitely organizations and communities that make quite uh, significant use of integral framework. Um, and so integral is yeah often re used to refer to the kind of emerging approach or paradigm that they're seeking to foster as well as the ecosystem itself. Um, regenerative is another term. Uh, yeah, often it's like the regenerative movement with regenerative ecosystem. And originally it came out of the environmental movement, um, kind of marking a, a different approach from uh, sustainability, which is about keeping things the same or trying to neutralize negative impacts. Um, whereas regeneration is about kind of actively making things better. So replenishing, restoring, improving resilience and capacity to regenerate. Um, and the term has kind of expanded to include design of regenerative cultures and systems. And yeah, it's it's become another term that to refer to this ecosystem or parts of it. Then we have game B, um, which is um, a sense-making community um, that is about kind of the need for a collective shift from what they call game A, which is basically the old paradigm, to a new kind of civilization, uh, which is termed game B. And it draws quite heavily on uh, game theory. Um, and in those terms, yeah, the idea is that game B doesn't reproduce the kind of rivalrous dynamics that are inherent in game A and that tend to produce existential risk. And finally, uh, we've got the, the Great Turning, uh, which was coined by Joanna Macy. Um, and it refers to a shift from the industrial growth society to a life-sustaining civilization. Um, and the idea is, here is that there's kind of three types of actions that are needed for this uh, tr transition. Um, there's actions that limit or reduce harm, um, action like structural changes that are kind of building at new societal forms and economies and a shift in consciousness. So that it's kind of the ontological shift in cultural values and norms. Um, and yeah, the, the kind of narrative is that, you know, we, we could be on a trajectory towards collapse or like a great unraveling, or there, there can be a possibility for something radically different. So like a great, a great turning. And this is probably one of the less commonly used terms in the space. So that was, um, quite a quick run through um i hope you were you were able to bear with me um and as you've seen obviously it's not comprehensive um there's probably still a bunch of other names and terms that we haven't included here uh, but just kind of to give you a flavor of the variety um and yeah some of the kind of get getting a sense of for some of the differences um so at this point we'd like to take a little pause and invite some quick reflections. Um, so we're gonna go into breakout rooms um, and we're gonna have about five minutes. Um, and the question for to reflect on is which of these names or terms do you tend to resonate with the most and why? Um, so Catherine, are you able to put us into breakout? Groups. Yeah, I can open them now. Yep. And yes, yeah, thanks. Letting let us know if you can't be in a breakout room. Uh, thanks, Elena. Oh, at least maybe oh, I'll keep an eye on the time.
Hi, I don't seem to have anybody in my breakout room. <laughs> oh, hi, Simon, let me move you to a different room. Where? Thanks. Okay. There we go, thank you. Oh, someone else seems to be alone in the room. Let's go to... Oops. Oh. Alone in my room, so I came back. <laughs> Sorry, Norian. Just sent someone to your room, so I'll send you uh, back. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Or, or you can rejoin. It, does he, do you see the invitation to join still? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can we? Um... Oh, I can. I can broadcast. Oh, yes, thanks. Shall we do 15 minutes for the next breakout groups? What do you think, Catherine? I know it's quarter two. Um, hmm. We could go halfway between 10 and 15, we could do 12. 12 ish to have time for nice. Okay, I'm gonna close the breakout room.
Oh. Welcome back. Yes, welcome back, everyone. All right. Okay, so um, it would be great to hear um, what came up in the breakout groups, um, if there was, you found that there was some convergence, uh, or if you were all kind of drawn to different names and terms, and yeah, just any kind of um, insights or uh, interesting questions that came up. So um, yeah, please feel free to, um, yeah, like, Put your hand up and then unmute and share. Hey, I've got something to throw in. Is my audio okay? Yep. Okay, sweet. Um, so there were three really interesting things that happened with Jason and I in a breakout room. Mm. Um, one was that there are some terms that are more digestible because, for example, for me, the liminal web is like, because I've read articles on it, because I can picture the organizations in it, it just feels more coherent in my mind. And I kind of like, there's a part of me that enjoys that and doesn't want it to be too broad or too vague. So there's something about like, just concrete direct experience that helps it be more digestible. That's one. I also want to throw in that like, the second Renaissance term speaks to my heart. Like, I feel excited by that. It brings up energy in me. And I'm like, yeah, it's my dream to be in this place of many exciting challenges and projects and be looking around and be like, oh, hey, what are we wanting to work on today? There's a sense of adventure to the challenge when it's framed that way. And, and I really like that. It brings me to life. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that was really interesting is Jason was sharing <clears throat> and we were thinking on how many people are left behind by these terms. They're too fancy or too kind of out of their experience scope. And, you know, he came up with kind of like, I was like, okay, well, how do you, how do you normally end up talking to people? And he's like, well, I just tell them like the government is broken and the economy sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, actually a really relatable phrase. <laughs> There's something interesting in there um, to, to find phrases and languaging that, that doesn't leave other people behind and kind of keeps it at a lower um more relatable level yeah i'll keep it there All right thanks so much yuli yeah digestibility definitely important and love love to hear the uh that the second renaissance term resonated um and and certainly and i think part of the reason that we want to go with that is because it it i mean it's still a new term in a sense but it kind of has a bit more of a you know people know what the first renaissance was so it's maybe already a bit more relatable um yeah, anyone else? I'll chime in uh, just, uh, Yuli, similar to you. Um, I wonder about even, even the fact of giving this thing a name, like what that, what that does to how people even think about it. And I find a lot of people want a name they want me to describe a movement or a thing that they can and then I can like explain it to them um but I do like to go the other direction uh and say like what are what are the challenges that you're finding in your life and then I'll start to draw connections I'll, I'll connect oh maybe that's connected to like this regeneration movement and there's this other organization or there's other space and I can point to more specific networks that they may have some familiarity with and then I say and imagine if all these things actually are connected because there's a bigger constellation that could be described, but everyone sees different stars in this constellation. Um, that's, that's more of a way that I use to communicate this. Um, and so these shorthands, these like labels or these, these uh, ways of, of holding the, the, the constellation between us, I think sometimes it's really useful and sometimes it, prevents us from inquiring more deeply. Well, what is the exact constellation that you're seeing here? Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for Narayan. And yeah, that links with um, uh, a conversation that we've also been having around um, My mind is just completely blanked. What if we want to name and, and, and like to what extent that kind of limits something and doesn't allow for complexity, maybe an emergence of it. 
that was part of it. There was something else, and it, I'm sure it will come back. Uh, but yeah, um, and maybe we can have one one more share if you got two more hands, 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 hands raised. Got, okay, great. Got, <laughs> got Ali and Phil, so we could maybe have both of them have got their yeah. hands up. Let me see. Lovely. I can't see hands up for some reason, but yes, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Um, so this came up in um, my conversation with Lauren, and it's about the naming. And I think uh, Yuli touched on that too. Is like, or maybe I think Narayan just said something about how just naming something and influences like says so much about it. Um, I resonate with um, the word Renaissance, but I'm having more trouble with second before it because I think that that is. Like it's, it, it comes with a lot of like, there's a lot baked into that about values and what, how people perceive the first Renaissance. And to me, it brings up the question of like, who is this for? Like these terms and this map, like what are we using it for? Um, Cause I was thinking about maps, like a map that's used by someone that does the weather, a map that's used for driving is very different than a map that's used by a pilot. It'll have different features because it's gonna be used in very different ways. And so um, the question coming up for me is like, yeah, who is this for? And how might the map and even the terminology that we use be different depending on the clarity that we have around who this is for? Um, but yeah, and it's just overall brilliant work. And I love um, the ecosystem map so much and have been using it in conversations with people. So I just want to name that as well. Much appreciation for all that you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... I can share briefly. Um, I was with Jane, we had a great conversation. Um, I think first was the notice that, yeah, some of these are problem focused versus solution focused, like meta crisis, poly crisis. Um, and then we were wondering, yeah, like for different framing, what actually resonates um, for people and how's that shift? um what that looks like and then yeah what are the interconnections of how do we in interrupt these different wordings like wh where are the potential similarities and where are the differences but probably all pointing at something very core and can we actually you know connect across these um and i also found it very interesting of like yeah which one's the most digestible talked a little about game a versus game b very clean i mean i'm a big game b person um yeah, um, but uh, what other ways can we actually try and maybe have one larger banner that we all want to fall into, or we just have different clusters um, of different people all caring about different flags, but we're all kind of all in the same team on some some sense. Thanks, Phil. These are all all really great points and great questions, and do hold on to them because um, there's going to we're we're going to have like a couple of more really quick slides and then we're going to go back into breakout groups and more discussion um and yeah also just to your the the first point that Phil made really quickly um the problem versus solution focused we we kind of also noticed this and in fact I think we we're phrasing it as um some terms seem to refer to the the period of transition uh, mm -hmm or defining features of it. So I guess, yes, I can Renaissance would be one, the great turning, um, but then also meta crisis, poly crisis are kind of features of that. Um, and then we have uh, the ones that are more focused on the, the vision or the kind of emerging paradigm. So integral, meta modern, so on. And then I guess like the liminal web, um, emergencia is another one I've heard of that we have included are more the ecosystem itself. Um, but yeah, that's another little quick aside. Um, and so, yeah, Catherine, can we go back to the final little bit of the presentation? Um, ah, friend, you coined emergency. Fantastic. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I do, we do plan to include that as well. Well, yeah, it's a work in progress.
Okay, so so yeah, some of the research questions, which we've basically kind of already touched on these, but um, yes, yeah, some of the things that are coming up for us, do these terms then describe the same space or ecosystem? Um, or are they kind of pointing towards different things and how important are those differences? How proximate are they? Um, or are they kind of sub sub tribes or tribes of a larger whole? Um, and if so, how do they relate to each other? Um, what are some of the dimensions of difference and similarity? And then how, how can we map these uh, and visualize them in a way that is helpful? So this uh, points to, well, yeah, one of the points that was raised um, in the discussion around you know, what is the map for and who is it for? So these questions very much come into that. Um, and we also just wanted to show you very quickly. Um, <laughs> Can I say yeah. one thing just before we show you, just before we show that, just one second. I just want to have a little context, which is very, very briefly for people. And, and is that while we're kind of, we like research and we're, we're doing it, we're also very, we're pragmatic utopians. So we want to emphasize that there is a kind of context for this. And I'll, I'll put a longer link in here of like of the original kind of motivation, but we're not also just kind of idly like, isn't it called a map? We think that this makes quite a big difference. Not that there is like an answer, but this kind of process in in kind of potentially cohering more powerfully, in finding mutual understanding, in connecting with other groups. I mean, I always, you know, just to give an example, I don't know the people, but I've encountered my time and I, I have quite a lot of friends who are like effective altruists, for example, or you know, and just trying to like even situate like how is this similar or different? That's kind of a group even you might say which is more broad or kind of proximate or distinct from the ecosystem. Um, but it's just this kind of aspect of kind of sensing where people are, allowing people to have common language. You know, the Tower of Babel story resonates for a reason, which is that when we can't, you know, have a shared language of some kind, it makes it much difficult, more difficult to coordinate. So I just want to emphasize, we also have the kind of pragmatic, you know, motivations here. And we're not seeking to have something perfect, but also something that's kind of useful. Um, anyway, back to you, Elisa, with an yeah, example. Thanks, Rufus. Um, yeah, so just very quickly, wanted to show you um, the kind of a really rough uh, sketch that we, uh, well, our kind of one of our collaborators, um, Matt Osborne, created. Um, it's kind of a bit a finger in the air map of this kind of emerging space and beyond. Um, so, but yeah, this is very much work in progress, um, and you know, very likely to change substantially, uh, possibly even get scrapped. We'll see. But uh, just yeah, just to say, watch this space um, because there there's more coming. Um, and so, yeah, I think now we can move on to the kind of bigger questions for discussion. Um, yeah, so we're going to invite you in a moment again to go back into breakout groups. Um, and these are three questions that we've got there for you. Um, so the first one being, do you think these names and terms refer to the same space or ecosystem? Um, what do you see as some of the key similarities and or differences? Do you think there ought to be some convergence? Why or why not? And um, many of you have already brought up many kind of um, similar related points uh, and yeah, a lot of nuance already. So um, yeah, this is, I guess you can use these as prompts for discussion or just dig into um, any kind of thoughts I have already opened up for you. And yeah, and then we'll we'll see you back for another round of sharing. And we'll open these breakout rooms for 10 minutes, I think. I do the... Can you post the questions just in the chat into the rooms? That would be super, super helpful. Yes, and yes. And if you want to snap a, a photo on your phone of this slide as well, you can do that to take the questions into the room. Okay.
Liz, would you send the um, broadcast question? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I, I don't know if I can, does it, it doesn't really make sense to broadcast. Can I broadcast all three at once? It feels mm -hmm. like a lot. That's a good point. I think, I think broadcast, you can only see a, a short chunk of text, text anyway, so perhaps one by one. Perhaps, sorry, didn't hear that. So perhaps one by one. Oh, I think on. it's broadcast, I think only show up sort of a short chunk of text. Welcome back, everybody. Hey, is everyone back? I think so. Okay, great. Yeah, welcome back. Um, so, yeah, as we did last time, yeah, it would be great to yeah hear from you what came up, what you discussed, any kind of interesting takeaways or points of further discussion that you'd like to bring to the group. I'll jump in and I'm going to come out as Pro-convergence. I think intentional <laughs> linguistic convergence would be a benefit to us because thinking about it, the first time that liminal web or some other thing pops up into the mass media, some journalist is going to pick a name uh, if, if we don't. And we, we, you know, we don't have much control over that regardless of what we do maybe necessarily. But if we could rally around some umbrella, then... I'd probably rather go with that than whatever some journalist picks in some story or whatever just kind of emergently uh, takes off by, you know, outsider naming versus insider naming. And I'll, I'll add to that. Um, convergence is, is fine. I think it's, I think it's very perspectival. Like where you come from is what you'll understand, but convergence is fine. But along with the convergence, I think, uh, there has to be a story. It's like the narrative layer. Like the story needs to be created around that. And the archetypes, like the new archetypes have to come through. And since the meta crisis has such large hyper objects, each part of the meta crisis, like climate change and plastics, there's huge hyper objects. We need strong archetypes to counteract these hyper objects. So we need to get into the imaginal layer of people so that they believe in a new story. And in that new story is the convergence of the terms. I'd love to share a bit of what happened in, in my breakout room as well. Um, so I'm going to take a both and approach here, classically. Um, and so we looked at kind of the value of, of like larger names, larger ecosystem names, uh, in part as being for coordination, which you already named, um, but also in part of like staying flexible. 
um, kind of like realizing we're not the only players in the space. The challenges are beyond what we can handle. And it's dynamic and complex enough that we're going to need to continuously stay grounded in we're not the only ones. So there's some value of having this larger label that kind of continuously reminds us to go back into the wider pool of people. And then another value for a larger name was to kind of build in uh, some kind of ontology or some kind of like staying grounded in a, um, a style that allows more coherence when we're pushing the edges, when we're like innovating, creating new institutions. We want to do that more holistically. How do you do that? There has to be a kind of continuous reminder to stay in a, a particular type of coherence. I, I can't name it, but I can say that it feels like that's there. Okay, so that was on the larger name side. Then there's the, of course, we want smaller names because there's more specific coordination that people are doing and they're going to really highly value those, that naming and, and convening for those smaller, more local or more specific coordination roles. And then I want to add the and. So that was the both. And then there's the and. Like Brandon threw into, the, into our chat that he wrote an article about trying to create a taxonomy for different meta crisis oriented projects. And I just think like, oh, it's so interesting to consider like the language we choose for communities helps coordinate and ground, but there's other tools and techniques that are also adding coordination value, including taxonomies like what Brandon was writing about that helps people see their relationship to each other. And so I just wanted to kind of mention it's like, oh, right. I also want to look at other tools that are serving the same functions that we care about when we say, do we want a large name? Do we want a small name? It's like, what's the value there? But, oh, there's other tools that help that. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, yeah, that's us. I'll add something from our group that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, pointing at how people from different spaces use the terms to represent in some ways like very large complex paradigms and so it can feel really challenging to want everyone to adopt one of these words if what they're actually adopting is a very simplified layer of this term that doesn't actually convey the whole of what's used mm -hmm. um and so I think sometimes when people propose a name, they'll like they'll they'll have a whole like thought process behind it, and then and then there's almost like a, actually you know what I don't like that name because people are using it. And I know they don't mean it in the same way that I am. And I think I think there is something around complexity with what with what we're talking about. Like I I mean for for us for how many of us does poly crisis mean something very different than meta crisis? Or for how many of us do those two terms actually mean the same thing because of how we're sort of engaging with it? And if people start using the term metacrisis in a way that I'm like, I think they mean polycrisis, then it rubs me in a weird way as I'm listening to it. And that's just more like my own pedantic thing. But now I get confused if I'm speaking in a larger space and I use the term metacrisis wanting to mean something very distinct. And I know that it's actually just not landing that way. I've lost the preciseness of my language. I've lost a word. Similar things even happen as I'm using the term complexity right now. How many people just think I mean something complicated <laughs> <laughs> versus specifically pointing at like Dave Snowden's version of Kinevin uh, and complexity from that lineage. And, and I don't know, maybe there's another discussion around like how do we use language together and actually ensure the terms as they're being communicated maintain the level of fidelity with which we're wanting them to work. And I really, I wanna bring it back James to what you're talking about, which is when a reporter starts to talk about the thing and they necessarily take this 3D thing and condense it into some flat 2D thing. And we all read that article and we go, ugh, ugh, they've colonized my language. And it's like, what does colonized mean to me versus all of these other people? I don't know. I'm not really going anywhere with that, but our room was kind of talking in that direction and I loved it.
Go ahead, Rufus. Rufus has raised his hand. Yeah, no, I just wanted to build on, I think, first of all, just to share in our room, so, several that I think points resonated about, first of all, in, a lot of interest within the third question, um, you know, or that was the one that that provoked the most discussion, like, should there be convergence or not? And there was a kind of general feeling that that was interesting and how, how that happened. And even how, I, I'm paraphrasing, this was not my point, but uh, um but you know, even views about how convergence should happen is actually interesting. Like you know, I suppose I want to just echo this point that um, I think you kind of want both names and like kind of some degree. I don't like the word necessarily definition, but it is if there's a, a one thing, but definitely kind of outlines or like this is what we mean or narratives or principles that go with that. And I think that by the way, is is maybe the most important. And something we obviously talked about as a group and, and as a team at Life Itself is that it's maybe also setting out these principles. It's it's why um, one of the things on on the website, which I said is not, the, the second race on .net, which isn't like fully, it, it's it's out. Um, we haven't been kind of yet promoting it and this stuff. There's definitely refinement and quite a bit of adding to do to the site, including kind of references to the other terms on the front page. But one of the things was this idea of just this spectrum at the moment, even we find in talking with people of like, do you agree there's like something really not working? You know, a lot of people are like, yes, yeah, you know, even in outside. Then there's like, well, what do you think is the source of that? Um, and then there's like, you know, what do you, you know, what do you think is like the 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 kind of paths forward? And then how do we take action on that? You know, not only, you know, where are we going to, but how do we take take action? Um, joking, we sometimes call this the four noble beliefs because people might hear the the resonance with Buddha, you know, it's like, you know, there is, there is suffering. There is a source of suffering. There is a path out of suffering and here's how you go about it. Um, and what we notice is just like, maybe also seeing where people are on that spe spectrum and where also there are differences. So um, maybe quite a lot of people, even in our space agree on the diagnosis, um, but they agree there's visible science, but you know, what is the diagnosis? And, you know, I don't know. I, people might know like you know the techno optimist manifesto and the effective accelerationists you'd like you know there's not really a problem we just need more technology you know or um you look at maybe the web3 crowd in general you know it's like what well, we need these new decentralized systems of organizing um so i think that that's one of the things that we've also explored and what i'm getting at, at the end of that is that i think having those conversations which i think we often avoid because we think they can be conflictual uh, in a way, you know, right, we will end up disagreeing. But I think that they are done in a right way. They're extremely productive, you know, to, and with it, with some kind of structure to them, those questions about like, where, where do we agree and differ and constructively differ on, on for example, our diagnosis of what's not working or what path forward we should take would, would be really crucial. Because I think one of the reasons we struggle to can, to converge is because we don't discuss the principles and work out what, what principles we actually do agree on. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so this is related to what Rufus was saying and also inspired by Narayan's share, where I was thinking like, well, how do you know, like, do we want complexity for the sake of complexity or for the sake of accuracy? Do we want just the most accurate way to capture something? But even that says something about our values, right? And about our beliefs. And so how do we have conversations that bring some of those values that are in the background that are more implicit to the forefront? where we can talk about and explore the values and the like more axiomatic beliefs that shape our approaches. Like how can we have conversations about that? Because to me, I feel like that's kind of the thing that keeps coming up a lot when, we, when I think about all the different, um, you know, people in this space working at different things and the naming and the, and the differences that do keep coming up, you know, and even the sessions I've attended at Limicon, you know, perspectives about like masculinity and femininity and like religion and like different things like come up in a lot of sessions. And I think that I am asking myself, like, what's a way to talk about this, the values and the beliefs behind these perspectives in a way that's really productive. Thanks, Aaliyah. Um, yes, so I noticed about five minutes um, before the end, so perhaps we want to move to um, 
a closing. I'm not entirely sure how we would like to close. Um, Elisa, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I would say... Oh, maybe we, we have a what's next. We did have a quick what's next slide. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, let me share this. Um, Um, Elisa, do you want to talk for it, shall I? I guess, uh, so I guess in terms of what's next, or in, we've just gathered here some um, links to some of our, our work. So, so some of the, the pieces of work that we mentioned here. So um, yeah, the first part is where you can find uh, our existing directory of organizations and the visualizations that we showed. Um, and also the the state of sense making 2020 report that we mentioned is also on that website um, and it's currently a work in progress uh, a, a site um, which offers our second renaissance framing um, including uh, an essay the essay that we'll be presenting later this week at Limicon is also up in a kind of first draft version um, as well as a kind of there's a wiki in progress on this the second renaissance secondrenaissance.net site. Um, and yeah, we're very much open to, to collaboration. And um, uh, yes, so if, uh, also acknowledging that there are actually many people in this room um, with, with a lot of expertise and experience uh, in mapping. So uh, Narayan's the, the Flourishing of All Living Things, I think it's called, is, is we've, um, included that on our overview of mapping efforts, the Brandon's um, meta, the tribes, meta crisis, tribes, um, approaches to the meta crisis tribes um, table and mapping, uh, which we've also mentioned here today and Brent's work winning the um, emergency and Phil's game be wiki. So all these things like lots of expertise in the space. And um, so if people are interested to come and uh, kind of continue the conversation and keep working together. We have um, a research collective calls every Friday at 10 a.m. EST. Um, uh, I think with the time change that might become uh, an hour earlier. Um, okay. I think. Let's just focus on this Friday because we may move it back to accommodate the U.S. better anyway. But let's just say for now, this Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Okay. Yes, 3 p.m. And yeah, so there's the two things to flag. So um will be presenting uh, about the second renaissance framing more specifically at Limicon this Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern. And then we also have our research collective call um, open to whoever's interested uh, at 10 a.m. EST. Um, anything to add, Elisa or Rufus, before we wrap up? Um, maybe just how people can find the details for the research collective calls. Um, and uh, Rufus, did you post the link in the chat already on that? The research calls I've given the details of how to join that. Yes. Okay. okay so maybe just in closing to invite people to just um, either post in the chat or kind of a mute and maybe give us like one, one between one and three words uh, on how you're leaving and um, how today was for you. I think we can stop sharing, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Good. Good. Energized, aligned, encouraged, infused. Intrigued, energized, reconnected, appreciative. Lovely to read these reflection mm 
that you um, enjoyed enlivenment. Intention 